hear that? Less than 1% will be able to survive the, the exactions of this theory and live it. What I call top quality graduates is less than 1%. There's attrition at every step of the way. On the other hand, if you were to say, is it over zero? I would say, probably yes. You say, you mean you're not sure? No. We haven't had, here it comes, the top inquisition yet. In other words, the top tests haven't come yet. The biggest filters are yet to come. I'm going to tell you something right now. That top inquisition was the May 1st meeting, my letters that followed from that, and the subsequent behavior of his market that reduced the number from 100 down to about 20. Now, if you, you may say, well, I mean, is Galamos really referring to that? I mean, in terms of numbers? Yes, I categorically reply. Because here, in V50X Session 3, Part C, on page 212, he says, and I quote, please listen, it's probably one in a thousand before you get from the class of people who first have been exposed to the existence of V50 to the time you get one total person who knows how to live this. And then he may not be a Holly or a Newton. He might just be operating a peanut stand, but he does it right. I'd like to point out the yield is low. You say, one in a thousand? Well, that's disastrously low. No, it isn't. That's an enormous yield. That's better than Archimedes had. That's better than Bruno had. If you'll remember, February, year 16,000, Bruno was burned alive on the Campo dei Fiori in Rome. There was nobody to defend him. Not one verse spoke out to save him. And his heroic words, just before he expired, were to the cardinals who were his murderers, he said, perchance, this, I have accepted this sentence of death with less fear than with which it was passed. And he was burned alive and killed. Nobody today gives a damn about who his murderers were. If they're remembered at all, it's because they were the murderers of Bruno. He was all alone in the world then. He had no zero to one transition. And yet, today, he rides the skies. His opinions are completely corroborated, and nobody even questions them. I'll never forget when I was in Carmel, California, at one of his great seminars called Concept 21. He ended the first night we were there. It was late at night. He told the story of Bruno. And he told him that, you know, today nobody questions what he said. He's the one who first said, you know, that not only is the earth not the center of the universe, but the sun is not the center of the universe. It's just a star, like all those pinpoints of light you see out there. And if you had stronger vision, you could look beyond those stars and find a universe of stars of infinite number. For that, he was burned alive, and because of other transgressions against the church. Galambo said he today is totally victorious. And so the question was, how did Bruno win? I'll never forget his words. He said, ladies and gentlemen, take that home, to your, take that to your rooms tonight and ponder that, and I'll see you in the morning. And I'll never forget, we came back in the morning, he says, okay, how did, how did he win? <laughs> and nobody could answer it. They didn't know how he had won. And his answer was, because he was right. He said, ladies and gentlemen, that is a huge point. That absolute rightness is the strategy of victory. The question is, how do you know you're right on an absolute basis? And bingo, he was off to this great discussion, how do you know you're right, the scientific method and, and all that. So here he is saying that... Um, to get a small number, one out of a thousand, is a relatively small number, but on an absolute basis, is quite large. 
if we have 20 people that have made, who have acted properly, who have had the courage to denounce these people, who have told me of their actions and are safeguarding these possessions, this stolen property, for Galamos' sake, that's a pretty big number. You passed through the top inquisition. I put you to the test. It was the thing that Galambos taught us to do, and you did it. That's why you're here. And this is a large number. And let me corroborate it once again with Galambos' words here. He says, I'd like to point out the yield is low. You say, one in a thousand. Well, that's disastrously nil. No. No, it isn't. That's an enormous yield. That's better than Archimedes had. That's better than Bruno had. Most people are totally impervious to reason or to morality, and they will find some point at which they will take offense and drop out or lose patience. So much so that out of 22,000 people, there's only about 20 to 22 people left who have any moral behavior that's consistent with the theory. So I said, well, all right, I got Galamos on my side here. He even told me the number. And we're right down to the exact, it can, almost, it's uncanny. You just, you get almost the exact number. I mean, to the number. I said, these will be the people that deserve to receive the greatest education that's ever been offered, the roadmap to the natural republic, Sikitur at Astra, and they will get it. And Galamos would love this. They're gonna, you're going to get it free of charge. You know how much I'm going to charge this? I'm putting this on videotape right now. Original price for this library, no less than $15,000, 1000 bucks a volume. You know how cheap that is compared to the ridiculous, stupid tuitions people pay to go to these damn nurseries of socialism they call colleges and universities these days? The University of California, San Diego, the average price is about 40000 bucks for tuition and books, and et cetera. Multiply that by four. That's 160,000 bucks over a four-year period. If you go to Harvard, oh my Lord, you're talking pushing 400,000 bucks. Not to mention all the incidental expenses that go along with that. And what do you get for it? Do you understand human reality? Galamo says, not a chance. If I can find it here, that um, Galamo says again and again that um, everything you've ever been taught is dead wrong. And I can't remember where it is here. I should have looked it up. But anyway, that's what he said. He said, everything you've been taught is wrong. You may say, it is. What am I doing wrong? Here's my answer. This is harsh, but listen. You can't refute me. Let's assume that you have children. And you're sending them to the public schools. All right. Question. Are the public schools proprietary? Hmm? What's the answer? Let's hear it. Absolutely, Absolutely not. They're funded and directed and controlled by the state. Private schools, no better. They still teach the same damn curricula. Relativism, nihilism, Dependence upon Big Brother as the state to guide your life. All right? You bring children into the world. Did they ask to be born? Not a chance. Do they have a right to expect from the parents preparation for life? Absolutely. All right? So it's incumbent upon the parents to teach the children what they need to know to direct their steps in life in a manner which is consistent with mature behavior, the ability to accept responsibilities for everything you do. And that means to be rational and moral. If they make errors, and we all do, you have the mechanism to rectify those errors. You need to be brought up in the heritage of Western civilization. You have to understand the philosophy of physics, how it's applied to volition and so forth. Essentially, what's in this, this book here. That's the parent's responsibility. If you abdicate that responsibility and you turned your children over to the schools where, uh, quite frankly, inferior people who become school teachers 
and I claim most of them are inferior. They're the weaker ones, the less educated. And they teach them collectivism, relativism, and the rest of it. What has the parent done there? He's violated a contract. Is it a written contract? No, it is not a written contract. It's a quasi-contract, meaning as if a contract. Galanos teaches this. A child can speak without words. The child can cry. The child can make gesticulations. The mother answers those gesticulations and cries, and a contract is born. And all the way up through the middle years of growing up, the parents, if they're responsible and if they're moral, will teach their children the difference between right and wrong and prepare them and discipline them along the way. If they turn them over to the schools and abdicate that responsibilities to the universities and the colleges, and the child comes home a socialist with a generation gap you can't ever bridge again with, between you and them, why, that makes you a criminal. Criminal because you violated a contractual responsibility to prepare your children for life. That's how powerful this theory is. The schools are compulsory. That means coercive. That means immoral. I talk to people and I say, well, you like this theory? Yes. Good, I'm glad you do. How come you're sending your kids to school? How come you're doing that? You should know better. I had a woman at Keneal Bay, Julie, remember that? Say to me, Mr. Martin, I can't refute you, but, 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 but I don't want to give up my free time. She was actually telling me the truth. I said, well, how about that? That's so, that's so refreshing. Remember, we were there, Pete, Keneal Bay. It was the wife of the top producer for the American General, or no, not American General, but whatever company it was we were there with. She just openly said it. Well, that would take away my free time. Your free time, my you know what. Okay. So, time goes on. I write the pamphlet. This history it takes me almost two years to do. Then I took time out, and between the months of, um, yeah, from 11, the 3rd of November 2001 to the 19th of January of 2002. No day interrupted. Working from 7 o'clock in the morning on the average till 11 or 12 at night. Taking time out only to relieve myself and to eat once a day. It was quite good. I lost a lot of weight. I did a complete final proofread of this book. That was a killer. That was a killer. To go back over this stuff and read every single word, every, look at every punctuation mark, every comma, every period. Whew, what a job. Then I did more work on the front matter. I hope that you will look at the front matter here and see that what is in there in the front matter. There's a foreword that I wrote. And think about that. How do you write a foreword to a book like this? Can any human being other than Galambos do it? That's a very daunting task. You know this is going to have to stand up in history. You better get it right. That took a hell of a lot of rewrites over a long period of time. But I think I have it now. And I think you'll agree when you read it. Then we did more work on the front matter in the, in the Sikhi toward Astra. Uh, I got back to resuming the, the work on the pamphlet. I re we requested uh, quotes on printing V50 for a three-session in introduction. Eric, do you know where that is up here? You know where it is? Yeah. Yeah, see this right here? This is a beauty. This is beautiful. I decided that since Galamos gave a three-session introduction, remember that? You had a chance to do that? And since session one deals with the problem and the definitions, the original definitions of property and freedom and all that, and session two deals with the scientific method, the epistemology of, you know, that produces rationality in the physical sciences, 
And then session three introduces morality and the postulatory structure. Hell, you got the whole damn theory right there. First three sessions. I'm going to use this as a screen. If people can't get through this, if they don't find this the most thrilling and exciting intellectual adventure of their lives, these first three sessions, I'm not going to make available this book to them. This is a beautiful, this is a primer, a little primer. It's really beautiful. I uh, wrote in the foreword. This introductory ticket and sampling of the first three sessions of Andrew J. Galamos' revolutionary Sikhi to Ardastra is intended for intelligent persons who care about the future of the human species. If you are one of those intelligent persons, the first of these three sessions will sensitize you to the crises presently confronting mankind, the alternatives for civilization and the consequences to be expected, the inadequacy of the present technologies to cope with these crises, and the new approach to freedom. You also will learn the first few fundamental definitions of Galamos' theory of volition, along with the importance of precision, as well as the identification of the path to be taken to achieve genuine solutions to problems. The second session will teach you the requirement for absolute standards of rightness and will provide you examples of relative and absolute rightness. You will be taught the success in achieving absolute standards in physics and the failure to do so in the social sciences. You will go on to learn the identification not only of absolute rightness in the physical sciences and why there has been failure thus far to extend this to the social domain but also of how to overcome this successfully. Further, you will learn the identification of absolute rightness in the volitional sciences and what the scientific method really is and how it has now been applied to volitional science. Those, those words are so revolutionary you can't believe it. That's so revolutionary you can't even believe it. Nobody else outside this room even knows what this means. In the third session, you will learn how a new science of volition has been established and the two basic postulates that make this possible along with examples and application. The result, you will be inspired to master all 12 volumes of Sik Etur et Astra, for without the knowledge and principles contained in these volumes, no man can build a new life for himself or help to build the world of freedom to come. Proprietary notice is there. It's Galambos's. It has stood the test of time. It's all there. And then the table of contents. Every single puzzle piece, every topic, every subhead, and every chapter. Look at that. Look at that. There. And that's it. That's table of contents. You go to this, and you come part A, session one of E50. I would like, at this point, uh, if we have it, do we have that in the recording, Eric, or not? Session one of E50? Yeah. Do you have that ready to go, or is it V50X? Oh, that's, uh, we won't bother that. Let me read it. Just read the first paragraph. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first session of V50, the basic course of the Free Enterprise Institute, and the one from which all progress thereafter stems. You like that? Huh? Does that sound like Galambos? It is Galambos. I'd like to point out that this first session may be quite different from all the others that will follow because from my own personal standpoint, frankly, it's a very difficult session to teach. Does that sound familiar? I sure, I'm sure it does to you. Probably the most difficult of any session of any course that I've ever taught because I have to explain to you in this session what it's all about and what you're here for. And that's pretty hard to do in the framework of one session. Actually, you notice the course doesn't even have a title. Or, more accurately, it does, but it isn't published. That in itself, there's a reason for, which I'll explain at the end of the course. I mean, that's vintage Galambos. There's nothing changed, man. I tell you, that decision I made to keep it all perfect, no matter how awkward it may be, use some punctuation and some formatting, paragraphing, work with it, try this, try that, four, five, six times with Eric working on the computer screen. And then we, we both agree, ha, oh, that's it, leave it. Just like that. The dash works perfectly. The exclamation mark. Holy moly. Oh, start a new paragraph. Use some dialogue here. Oh, that works. And gibberish, what seems to be gibberish, which isn't, all of a sudden comes into its, its beauty. That's what the true editing is. But I never took out any words. I never changed anything. Now you want to hear what Mrs. Columbus did? I'll read it. Uh, 
Um, she says here, this is the first lecture of V50, the basic course of the Free Enterprise Institute and the one from which all progress thereafter stems. It's not quite the same, but it's essentially the same. It is quite different from all of the 15 lectures that follow because I have to uh, begin by explaining what the course is about and what the subject matter will be. The real beginning of the formal development of the theory of this course starts with lecture two. In this first lecture, I will indicate the purpose and the scope of the course. I will, so what you're hearing here is uh, paraphrasing and the use of the personal pronoun, I, which is, is not what he said. And so I said to myself, I, I couldn't do this. I can't, I can't make Alamo say something that isn't exactly what he said, especially when we have the tapes here. My God, and it works beautifully with the tapes. I mean, Galambo said, it's their standard operation. Mrs. Galambo's changed that to, it's their leitmotif. Galambo said, you can jump off a cliff, and you can defy the law of gravitation, and wiggle your arms, but that's all you can do. You can defy it, but you cannot violate it. Mrs. Galamos changed that to, um, waved his arms. Didn't like the word wiggle for some reason. Galamos referred to American presidents as, um, Eric, shall I, shall I pull out the concordex? I'm going to do it. Concordex. Where is it? Here. Would you like to know what Galamos said about American presidents? This will bring a laugh. This kind of stuff was edited out. Yeah, wrong glasses. Okay, well, let me look up presidents here. I have to read it to you. Presidents. Globals. <laughs> These are just, I'll, I'll just read it random, some of the entries. Subject, presidents, about the lowest level of intellectual capability that can be named. <laughs> Here it is. You ready for this one? This is the kind of stuff that got edited out because it was a little bit too uh, salty, a little bit too earthy. But that's Galambos. That's the stuff that goes straight to your hearts. Well, the American versions are emasculated, effeminate fairies. I kept it in there. It's beautiful. You should have seen his imitations of the, um, what's his name, the guy that was the car dealer? Ralph, Ralph, Williams. Ralph Williams. And and so we put in there, we put in. On one occasion, Galamos is talking about something, and he's, it's very complimentary to him, and he's embarrassed by it. So he goes, Susie? Now, you would, you would normally, a conventional editor would take that out. Because after all, we're here to learn this science. Susie, come on up here. You hear shuffling of papers. So I put that ambience in there in bracketed, italicized text. Mrs. Galambo's coming forward. Then you hear all the, the microphone being taken off and fixed on her little lapel. Then she steps forward and you hear some stuff. And, and then she goes, she tells this great story about her husband. The upshot of which is, he was so great. The whole audience is, it comes apart. It's laughing so hard. Then you hear the shuffling. The thing is back on his list. I describe his wife going back, and he says, well, she said it. <laughs> and it was just great. It was it's fantastic. And all this kind of ambience, uh, all that stuff was taken out. The color was gone. The essence of the man was gone. And this theory here is not like learning celestial mechanics. This is not like learning chemical valencies. This is not like learning navigation. This is learning about human behavior that breaks completely from the past without violating the concept of rightness on an absolute basis. But when you say, I, and I'll, I'll give you uh, a, a challenge that was put to me. 
by a couple of gentlemen. They said, Martin, you're different from anybody I've ever met we've ever met before. What the hell are your basic assumptions here? I says, well, that's easy to answer. Well, what are they? I says, well, the first is the fundamental, universal, unexceptional nature of man, which is that all men live to pursue happiness. Yeah, yeah, well, so, so what? Everybody knows that. Oh, yeah. And the second is that all concepts of happiness, so long as they do not violate the concept of morality, are equally valid. That's it. Now, with those two assumptions, I can state that all political experiments in the history of man are wrong. They are invalid because they don't follow from these two assumptions. And I can derive from it freedom, which is the societal condition experienced by everyone in the fact that they have 100% control over their own property. And they said, that's too, what do you mean? That's too simple. And I said, hmm, if you were in Isaac Newton's company and he announced to you F equals MA, which is the second law of motion, or Einstein, who said E equals MC squared, that energy is equivalent to mass times the speed of light squared, I suppose you would say to them, oh, well, that's too simple. But they had an ego collapse over that. Because I was basically saying that with my two assumptions of life, which they cannot refute, refute everything they believe in and do. So it's, a, it's quite something. Um, let me turn to V50X, Mrs. Galamos' version of this, which I'm sorry to have to say, but it's the truth. The truth is the truth. You don't mess with it. Okay, let's do this, Eric. We can do this now. I, w I want to, first of all, I'm going to read to you. I think I'll, ha yeah, we'll play Galambos right after this. Let me, let me play to you what Mrs. Galambos had for Surface the Giant. She made it an appendix, Surface the Giant, Appendix B to V50. It's only 45 pages. The real V50X that Galambos gave which is the eighth volume, the twelfth volume right here where my finger is, V50X. That was three sessions, 200, over 200 pages. She amputated a lot of it. Now listen carefully and try to remember, and then we'll play the real thing. So that you get an understanding of what the hell I've been up against. She says, this extension to V50, let's see. Yeah, this is it. She says, she's making this Galambos' words. This extension to B50 has been necessitated by it becoming apparent to me that there was a problem in the course of that course, in the course, in that there was not an adequate discussion of the second postulate of volitional science. The oversight was partially because there was so much to put into the course and partially because it was difficult to get back to it once it had been discussed. Plus, the course was not pres presented in a rigorous manner in the sense that everything was derived exactly as it should be on the postulates. And I could read more. Let's, let's, let's let her go. Now I'm going to let you hear the master's voice and try to remember what I just read and see if there's any resemblance whatsoever to that. There's no resemblance whatsoever. He's talking about the history of the Institute. Here, turn it off, or, and then I'll read you this again. 
This extension to V50 has been necessitated by it becoming apparent to me that there was a problem in the course in that there was not an adequate discussion of the second postulate of volitional science. I heard something completely different from that. What'd you hear? You know? Sure. And that's personal, isn't it? How hey, I do this, Eric? How you turn it on? Yeah, right here. No. Just stay there. Take it back to the beginning, please. Yeah, and then before you play it, I'm going to read this again, the first sentence. Here's what she, here's what she has him saying. This discussion uh, to V50 has been necessitated by it becoming apparent to me that there was a problem in the course in that there was not an adequate discussion of the second postulate of volitional science. Now, that's what I, you've heard that now two or three times. Now hear the, what he really says. And as those of you who remember the old days of the Institute know, it was originally called Course 100. And you can stop. He, he, go, he takes you back. He gives you the history of his institute and all the beautiful things he did. And then he gives you why he needed to give this course. It's nothing. This, this is make-believe. And when I read this, I said, as much as I have liked Mrs. Galambos, and was very close to her for many years. Damn it. My fealty and loyalty goes to the professor. I cannot allow this to be done. And I lost most of the women in Galamos' market, almost all of them, as a matter of fact, because they have a tendency, as women are wont to do, to defend their fellow females. They stood up for Mrs. Galambos. And then they thought that I was a terrible man because I wasn't giving her the recognition of the work she was doing for her husband. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The most important thing in this whole world, ladies and gentlemen, is, the, is, is living rightly according to the principles of volitional science. You don't mess with it. You don't compromise it, not for anything. Not for anything. Okay, so that's a little sampling there. Um, I wrote the acknowledgement in the primer. It was on the 10th of March. I, the quotes for the printing primer, we did that again to find out how much it was going to actually cost to print this stuff. And it's very expensive. And then acknowledgments, uh, to, uh, more acknowledgments to the primer. And then I got further quotes to print the primer. That was on the 23rd of March, 2002. We compl I finally completed the forward to, uh, to Siki Toward Astra on March 21st of this year. That was just a few days ago. It took all that time to do that. And I won't read it. But if you get a chance, you go to volume one and read my forward to The Way to the Stars. So that was a hell of a job. Started in September of 1997. It ended on the first day of the new year, post-integration calendar. And I decided, I told Eric, I said, I'm being sued now by uh, Joyner and his crew up there on the grounds that, that I disagree with uh, Galamos' interpretation of World War II history. And it's true. I disagree with him. But I applaud what he did as a result of his interpretation of, those his, of that history. And I've consecrated my life to carrying out his testamentary wishes for me to do. And I have in no way, in any way, and it's unthinkable for me to skew his work or to harm it. After all, even though we disagree, on history, and especially the history of World War II and his interpretation of Hitler and the Third Reich and of, the, of, of Winston Churchill, even though I totally disagree and vehemently disagree with him on all those points, and I claim he's dead wrong, nevertheless, the inspiration that he got from those beliefs motivated him to do what he has done. And what the bottom line is, is that his theory does away with all forms of coercion. I don't care whether he, we agree or disagree on the history point. And that's my position. But because I've had those views, and because I was videotaped expressing my disgust with Winston Churchill, 
I call him the warmonger of World War II, and he wasn't even the one who was in charge of the aerial bombardment and the mass murdering and the violation of the Geneva Convention and the Hague Protocols, and deliberately murdered and killed and burned alive uh, 75 to 150,000 people at Dresden in the, in the last year of the war. He firebombed Hamburg. He wiped out most of the major cities of Europe. And he was taking his orders from Lord Cherwell. His real name was, well, it's not even his real name yet. It, his, but he is, it's, it's uh, Professor Lindemann. And that was the Lindemann plan. You should all learn about that. That has now come into the forefront of history. And it's caused quite a stink. And Churchill was not the man that, Hitler, that Guillermo said he was. Um, and Hitler was not the man that Guillermo said he was. Hitler's whole purpose in the war was to defend Europe against the Bolsheviks from the east. He did everything in his power to dissuade England from putting, uh, creating a war against Germany and defending and supporting Uncle Joe Stalin. And I said to myself, I wonder, I just wonder, if the Holocaust is really true. My wife said to me one night, it was the thing that caused me to really start thinking. She says, my gosh, don't they protest too much? Every single damn night on television, you got something about against Hitler and against the Holocaust and the Jews, the Jews, the Jews being persecuted. And Julie, I give you credit. I said, well, yes, why are they so, why, why? Hell, Stalin murdered over 40 million people in Russia. How come there's never any talk about that? I'm going to look into this. I really wonder what the Almanac says concerning the Jewish population of Europe between the years 1939 and 1949. I looked it up. You can too. Six million Jews living in Europe in 1939. 6.6 .6 million Jews living in Europe in 1949. Where the hell did they go? Forensic studies have been done of the so-called gas chambers. Chemistry doesn't lie. Hydrogen cyanide compounds binding to iron in bricks are very, very stable. It produces what is called prussic, Jew, uh, the, uh, prussic blue. It's a dye. It should be there. It isn't. I find that decisive for me. I have 23 other questions. If Galamos were alive today, with all due respect to him, I would ask him, do you really think it was six million Jews that were gassed to death in Germany in World War II when the Simon Wiesenthal Center and two different separate publications have said there were never any gassings of Jews in Germany in World War II? Now it's coming out that the whole thing is an extortion racket. So I mentioned this. I mentioned it. And I challenge anybody to show me it's otherwise. When we have Rudolf Hirsch, who was the commandant of Auschwitz at the Nuremberg trials, or just before that, he wasn't actually there. He was killed in Poland, hung in front of the very concentration camp he ran. He was tortured. He said, and it's in the record of the Nuremberg trials, so-called trials, they weren't really trials, they were show trials. He said, yeah, sure, yeah, I kill 50,000 Jews a day. Smoking cigarettes, I help them drag them out. We now know that that is impossible. The cyanide gas is highly volatile. It is so lethal that only after 24 hours of soaking a body that's been gassed with that stuff in water is it safe to even approach a body. 50,000 a day dragging the bodies out with his own hands while smoking a cigarette? What's he saying there? He who has eyes to see and ears to hear, you'll know that this has been extorted from me, and I'm letting you know it's a hoax. CIA photographs released in 1979 show that the aerial photographs of Auschwitz, just to name one of the concentration camps, show no smoke from the notorious chimney, number one. 
And number two, no coke piles. It takes a lot of heat to reduce a body. I got two clients, former clients, because I'm no longer in the business, who are morticians. I asked them, I says, how long does it take to reduce a body to ash? He says, well, there's no ash. You must know that, Mr. Martin. I said, no ash? Why not? Ah, it all goes up in, in gas. Body's made of oil and water. <laughs> it gets heated out, goes out in gas. What's left is shards of bone, which we put in plastic uh, churners and produce into what we euphemistically call ash. But if you ever picked up an urn, it's heavy as hell. It's bone. He says it takes 109 minutes on the average to reduce a body to, quote, ash, unquote. I said, really? So I went to my other mortician client. First one was Chuck Kern, Dr. Orr. And the second one was a man uh, in Corona. And I said to him, I says, how long does it take to reduce a body? He says, you want to see? Come on. <laughs> so I go down in the basement. Oh, my goodness. And there was a body in there. Big uh, cremation furnace was going. And he said, uh, yeah, we get done. He says, look in there, you'll see. You know, there's a window. And the body had already been reduced. And by the way, if you're ever going by a mortuary and you smell uh, cooking turkey, it smells just like turkey being cooked. That's, that's the vapors that are coming up out of the <laughs> chimney. Throw a little macabre humor into this meeting. <laughs> but it's true. It, that's what it was. They, they were reducing a body. And he told me the same thing. He says, unless you get a fatty. If you get a fatty, he says, you don't dare take the temperature up the way we do with normal people because of all that fat. He says, you get that temperature rising up, you know, a bell curve going up. You get up to about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, and if you're a fatty, they'll ignite, and you, you have a flame out. And I said, a flame out? He says, yeah, especially if it's at night. People see these flames leaping out of our chimneys. It's a scandal. It happened in Medford, Oregon one night, and everybody knew what it was. So we were very careful about that. Then I said, well, how do you get around it? He says, well, we take it up about 800 degrees and shut the thing off. So it goes back down again. Then you raise it up again. It takes twice as long, or I think twice as long, and then you can finally reduce the fatty. Now, what am I saying here? Six million Jews gassed and reduced to ash in the crematoria of the concentration camps of World War II. Think about it. Use your heads here. Six million. Do you know how many crematoria they had? I forget the exact number. It's a finite number, and we all know what the number is. We can get that information. And you put in 109 minutes. Then you got to remove the so-called ash. Then you got to reheat the thing. That takes a hell of a lot of fuel. Germany did not have oil. They did not have gas. Coal won't do it. You had to have coke. The aerial photographs said you'd have to have huge piles of coke at these concentration camps in the heat of the time when they were supposed to be murdering all these Jews. And, when there's no, and the aerial photographs show nothing. Nothing. With paranoistra, or perestroika, or whatever they call it, and glasnost, they released, finally, the records that were kept at Auschwitz. You know how many people died there? The records show 74,000. Of that number, about 14% were Jews. The cause of death, typhus. It was raging all over Europe at that time, carried by lice. Starvation, dysentery, and other diseases, and ultimately starvation because the goddamn allies bombed out the transportation centers and the German people in Central Europe were starved to death. And after the war, they had open fields, and they put them in there, and that Eisenhower uh, criminal actually made it a capital crime for anybody to support the Germans after the war who were put in these open fields to die. There are books out on this and lots of documentation now. If you bring it up in America today, you will become an enemy of the people. Now, I didn't mention all of these things in that meeting, but I did mention, I did challenge the Holocaust. As a result, Mr. Frederick Marx, who used to be Galamos' Jewish attorney, and uh, uh, Mr. Joyner, and about 
I don't know, eight or ten people in his theory have put declarations out and they say, I'm an enemy of the people, I'm a Holocaust denier, I'm a Hitler worshiper, and therefore not fit to do the work for Golombos. And therefore they're trying to get me removed and they're going to do it. If they, if they succeed, they will reconstitute his trust again and they will produce what is called a board of trustees consisting of five members. If that isn't a committee, I don't know what is. And they will decide by, and they say it in the petition, which I have up here, they'll decide by majority vote who shall be the new literary executor since William Martin is a man who obviously is dangerous to Galamas' theory. They don't know that I'm done. Only you know. I'm finished. And it's all preserved. And I never took out any of Galamas' vituperation against Hitler. And he has got some choice comments about Hitler, believe me, boy, all the way through the book. And I'm glad he felt that way. And I'll tell you why I'm glad he felt that way, even though I totally disagree. Because it motivated him to create a world in which Hitlers could never rise to power. Beautiful. There's the paradox of it. There's the irony of it. It's beautiful. So I have a clean conscience. And who taught me to do this? Galamos himself, he taught me the scientific method. There's three questions you should ask in everything you do in your life. There's three, just three. I took my daughter to see a movie called Braveheart. It's supposed to be a big, famous movie. I go there, I get up, and I walk out for 10 minutes. And she said, why are we leaving, Dad? And I says, don't you understand yet, honey? Don't you understand that you have to ask five, uh, three questions in everything you do? Is it true? Is it valid? Is it moral? That movie was immoral. It was invalid, and it was untrue. Do you know who kicked the Jews out of England? Do you know who it was? And do you know when? Anybody know? When? Edward I. Edward I. Yes. What was his nickname? Longshanks. Longshanks. He was how tall? Roughly 6'6". Six, six. He was a hell of a warrior. One of the greatest kings in history. His people came to him in, in 1287. And they said, we can't stand these Jews. They steal from us. They're swindlers. They're unassimilable. We must get them out of here. And, and Edward says, no. He says, let's put them on probation. It's not my opinion here, ladies and gentlemen. You can look this up and read it for yourself, which you probably won't do out of habit. But I'm going to tell you, it sure would be an interesting, exhilarating, thrilling experience for you to do what I'm suggesting. Go look up your history book. You'll find out that Longshanks tried to, to, to do justice for the Jews if he could, but they didn't do it. He said, here's what he told them. He says, okay, no more, no more of this uh, goldsmithing and money business. No more usury. We'll make crown lands available to you, and you can work like the rest of us and learn how to farm. Well, they wouldn't do it. So in 1290, he kicked them out, 4,000 of them put them on ships and sent them to France. When they got out of the North Sea, in case you never knew this or never read it, a lot of the people who had, been, had their daughters raped, who had had money stolen from them, swindled, ruined businesses, went out into the North Sea and overtook some of the king's ships and slaughtered the Jews that they were hunting down. They got kicked out of France in 1306 by King Philip II or Charles II, and then they went to various places in Europe. They got kicked out of Tuscany. They got kicked out of Siena. They got kicked out of that Rome, and finally in 1492, uh, Ferdinand and Isabel said, we've had enough of these people, they're going, and it's on penalty of death that they don't get out of here. On August the 3rd of 1492, uh, the king and the queen sent them out. And they said, you can stay if you'll convert to Catholicism. Those who did were called conversos, but the Spanish called them maranos, which means pigs. They hated them. And you know what happened? Would you like to know what happened? The Jews worked their way up in the Catholic Church, and when they were found out to be doing things that were subversive of the, of the religion and stealing again from the hated Goyim, the Gentiles, the Catholic Church produced a little thing called the Inquisition, and they executed the traitors, mostly Jews. It puts a little bit different slant on what you were taught in these goddamn schools you, lived, you went to. Now, if Galamas were alive today, I would sit down with him, and I'd ask him, Professor, 
I've read that in the Almanac, at the end of the war, there were 600,000 more Jews than there were in 1939 at the beginning. Do you know that? What do you think of that? There have been four different forensic studies of the gas chambers that take the stupid, hapless tourists uh, who are, where they're told that these were the actual gas chambers. Professor, those four forensic studies done by the Americans, the French, the Poles, and um, the Germans have shown that chemically speaking, it never happened. What do you think of that? Remember when Galambos met with Obert, he was told by Obert that the Holocaust was propaganda. Galambos didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. But even more tellingly, after the war, just after the war, when Galambos was in southern Germany, he went to see one of his father's best friends. Eric, do you remember the name of him? Okay. I've got it in my notes. He went to see him, and his, Galambos' his father don't go see him because he became a Nazi. So when Galambos went to visit his father's revered friend, a man who obviously had to have a high degree of intellectual accomplishment and integrity, the man was so frightened when Galambos came up, he didn't recognize him. He thought that the damn uh, American troops were going to put him in, in, in a trial for being a Nazi. And when he found out, Galama says, don't fear, I am jo uh, Joseph's son. And the man relaxed, brought him into his home. And when the subject of the Holocaust came up, or the Nazis, the man looked Galamos in the eye and said, the Nazis never did anything wrong. Now that's another person of huge brand name that Galamos didn't even credit for a second. So I look upon that as chauvinism carried to a fault, personally, but it in no way has impacted upon my loyalty to him in doing the work that had to be done and which nobody else did or could do. I'll finish up this now. My wife, I asked if she would do an audit of the actual tapes the tape recordings. I said, you know, I don't trust the transcribers. I think we owe it to Galambos to go back over this and listen very, very carefully to make sure that everything is there. She started that on the 22nd of February, 1999, and she finished that wonderful labor on the 8th of July of the year 2000. Now, think about that. That's over a year of work, and she worked every day on it very carefully, making the tape go forward, stop, listen, ooh, no, no, he didn't say that, he said this, make the change, in red ink, now turn it back, double check yourself, this took time, wore out tapes, wore things out, wore out the machine, you know how many changes she made, we counted them. Anybody want to make a, make a try? A lot. I got a lot. Okay. Very good, Nick. Uh, very beautiful. A lot. You're right. It's a lot. That's a clue, ladies and gentlemen. It's a lot. Give it a try. Let me hear a word. Tom, give me a number. 5,000. Wow. 20,000. <laughs> you really. <laughs> okay, I'll give you the number. Thanks for the offers. 10,950. They consisted of two categories. Additions of laughter or atmosphere that weren't there that we wanted to put in there. Then that's not the fault of the transcribers necessarily. They didn't really know. Nobody had thought that that was so important. But the other part, which is about 60-40 in favor of, she uh, caught errors, actual errors. Let me give you an example. You know who the great um, geneticist was, H.G. J. Muller? You heard of him before? He's the one that worked with Drosophila or fruit flies. They reproduce really fast. You can go through maybe 10 or 12 uh, generations in a, in a real big hurry. And he, irra he irradiated them with x-rays. Just 
beamed the x-rays through them. Nothing happened in the second generation. The genes were still good. The female eggs were okay. The sperm was fine. Next generation, everything fine. Perfect little flies. Fourth generation, perfect flies. Fifth generation, same. Sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, all the same. No harm. Twelfth generation, the baby flies came out as monsters. Literally, monstrous, incapable of survival and incapable of reproduction. And the great message of H.J. Muller, I think he got our Nobel Prize for this, pretty sure. But his message was, you better not mess around with all of this atomic radiation business. If it took tw 11 generations before you could get to the cessation of that species, you never know, that could happen to the human race too. And it takes a long, 25 to 30 years for a single human generation to pass. It takes a long time. Times 12, that's hundreds of years here. We don't know what's in store for us. Well, the transcribers don't know their history. There are some ladies doing this part-time. They put down H.J. Miller. Miller. Thanks to Eric, we corrected that. It's H.J. Muller with no umlauts over the U. SPQR. That's the equivalent of the USA for Rome. The Senate, the Roman Senate, and the people. It consists of three, I think it's three words, but they didn't know what that meant. So it was all typed up. You didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Unless you, are, you have literature in your belly, you've read the classics, and you are a man of literature as well as philosophy, and you're highly educated, and you are conversant with the heritage of Western civilization, and you have a rapport with distant peoples and distant ages, and you've spent your whole damn life multiplying your existence so that you know more than anybody, or at least you've hope to. That's what Galamos needed for a literary executor, and that's what I had. I knew what these things meant. Then we find that after Julie had done all this magnificent work, which meant we had to go back and put in the changes, then came one day in September, I think it was early September, of the year, I forget which year it was, I think it was the year 2001, but I'm not really sure, but I think it was. Yeah. Martin Atkins, over here, sitting next to Victoria, came into my office one evening, and he had a disturbed look on his face. I went, uh-oh. And uh, he was flushed. And he says, Bill, I've been auditing the last few sessions of V201, and I've noticed that there is a comma here and if you take that comma and you move it two words or three words forward, uh, uh, back in the sentence, you still have a properly punctuated sentence. But the meaning goes from this to this. And the transcriber put the comma in the wrong place. And it changed the whole meaning. I went, oh my God. You seen any more like that? And he said, quite a few. Oh, my God. After all this work. So Martin Atkins, along with Eric, went into one of the greatest achievements I, I can possibly imagine. We would not have this, these volumes here if it weren't for their work. Coming in behind my wife, they re-added back into the text, text I had edited out because it didn't make any sense. One of the chief culprits of the transcribe was they, she loved to use the word, the preposition, which. And when you put a which into a sentence, it kills what follows. It's like Glamis is trying to say something, and he gets off on a tangent, and then he forgets about it, and then he goes on. You delete it. You just delete it. Martin comes in and he says, he didn't say which. No such thing. He said that, or some word like that. Then all of a sudden, you take that out of there. Oh, my God. What a beautiful sentence. Galamos, we're so sorry. <laughs> I mean, oh my God. And we rescued all kinds of texts that way. That took, let me see my notes. That took from the 21st of August 19, wait a minute, let's see.
Yeah, eight, uh, the 21st of August, 1999. No, no, that's indexing. Final audit. Yeah, here it is. From uh, September of 2001 to January 17th, 2002. They dropped everything to do this. That was another 10,000 changes with enhanced auto, audio equipment. Instead of listening to those tapes and going back and forth with primitive information with bad acoustics, which Julie had to work with, they had computers and they could, like, I, I used to see Eric work on it. He would, he, would, he would have the screen, he could see where he was in the course, he goes with his finger like this, taps it, taps it back, taps it, taps it back. Great audio. He goes, and he, and he, and he would stop and he'd go, no, I don't know. Bill, come in here. I go in and we both listen real carefully. I'd say, turn it up. Turns it all the way up. We get our ears down. We listen. Eric goes, it's this. I'd say, no, it isn't. It's that. <laughs> we go back and forth. Play it again. Keep playing. Keep playing. And then we then I would stop, take time out, read the context. Well, what would it be? What's the probability of favoring me versus you, Eric, or you versus facing me? Play it again. Oh, then it became clear. And then we heard it, and we changed it, and we salvaged another paragraph or another sentence or another fragment of a sentence. And this took hours and hours and days and days of total dedication. I told Eric, I says, this is what Columbus was looking for. This total unipurpose dedication, working day and night to make sure that this genius could be perfectly represented all the way through all 12 volumes. So then we have that final proofread, and then the further indexing. And Eric did all of the indexing for V201, all eight sessions. He did it once while he was gone in a another country. When he came back, I was already indexing V50 and V50X. And I, and I said, My, this is crap. I, I don't know. This is no good. I, I got to do better than this. So I said, scrap it. And I go back and I start again. And I say, OK, now, Galamos is talking about freedom right here. Now, how did he put it? It's in that text. Well, hell, why don't I just quote that right there? And we'll incorporate that into the concordex. And I went, oh my God, I just made a discovery. This should be a running commentary by Galamos himself. We've got the text. We can put it in. We'll quote it whenever we can with very, very few uh, alterations with articles and, and prepositions to, to make it readable. So we started all over again. And the indexing work has taken, uh, would you say, two years at least? Yeah, two years. Two additional years years. Meanwhile, kept reading over the text. Every time Eric did his indexing, and every time I did my indexing of V50 and V50X, I got a chance to read the text again. What's that called? Further proofreading. And you know something? We found misspellings, or we found different, we found cor corrections, or I came across passages that says, nah, I should have used a dash there, not a semicolon. Nah, the colon's no good. Or, no, the dash doesn't work. No, not to the I. And the I means a lot. That should be a colon. Boom, you put it in. We go look out on the computer screen. We say, ah, that's it. That's what it is. Now play it. Let's listen to it. Yeah, the colon. Or, no, yes, the dash. Semicolon. Comma. No commas. Gumballs is not pausing. He's going on a run here. This is a run-on sentence, and it should not have a single punctuation mark because he's talking fast. He's making a big point. Boom, 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 boom. And we get to the period, and we have no punctuation. 